religious pursuits. The whole despotic system of government was resting on just a few weak individuals. Russia was being hollowed out from within, and the vacuum at the center was creating dangerous instability." End quote. Now everything that Peter Hart says right there could have applied to several other countries in this story. Everything except one thing. The part dealing with Rasputin. Grigory Rasputin is a great wild card in this story and a quintessentially Russian figure. I mean, he's, it's hard to imagine him anywhere else and he is outrageous and larger than life. And I think Peter Hart, as great a historian as he is, he sounds a little bit like he can't understand. You know, the Tsarina, the wife of the Tsar, kind of falling for this guy and his shtick. He calls it the ludicrous Rasputin cult. I mean, if you'd have had her here to ask her, she'd have probably said to you, but I saw him do it multiple times. Do what? Save my son's life. If you saw somebody save your kid's life multiple times, don't you think it would be hard to have your logic override what you think you saw? Whoa. I've seen cold-hearted, total realists turn into people seeking quack remedies when they were dying of cancer. They were looking for hope. If your kid is dying, you're looking for hope. What if somebody actually comes through? I mean, what if that quack treatment for your relative's terminal cancer cured the cancer? That's the weirdness in this story. The, the, the royal family, the emperor and his wife, run into this guy, Grigory Rasputin, first in 1905, about 10 years before the time period we are in the story. And there's an entry by the Tsar in his diary, we met a man of God today. And so starts this relationship between this person who was born a poor peasant in Siberia, you know, uneducated everything, and his relationship with two of the most royal figures in the world. I mean, when you think of the king and queen of England, that's the level we're talking about with the Tsar and Tsarina. Imagine today's queen of England, who has no power at all, picking up some person off the street who's almost homeless, and not even a London homeless person, someone from the sticks up in the north of England, somewhere some small town, bringing them in the palace and having them live with you for a while, and sort of questioning them on the state of things, and what are the people saying, and, and oh yeah, letting them minister medicinally to your child. It's a crazy story. And the only reason Rasputin becomes important, you can hardly imagine him important in most of the other systems of government. But because Russia is so autocratic, if you capture the Tsar, you capture the country. Rasputin made the royal family That's cool. emotional hostages. Now, whether that was intentional or otherwise is debatable. Historians disagree. There are some historians who think this is a person who thought he was a blessed man of God with these special powers to do, you know, religious oriented things. And others say he's a charlatan and he knew he had the royal couple sort of emotionally blackmailed, but there was nothing anyone could do about it. There's a great quote from the Tsar, you know, in the middle of this story with Rasputin, where one of his advisors says something to the effect of, you gotta get rid of this guy. And the Tsar's answer is, there's nothing I can do about it. And a lot of historians have always interpreted that to mean that the Tsar is basically saying he can't stand up to his wife. You know, that she wants him and there's nothing that the Tsar can do. He won't stand up to his wife. But, you know, some historians have come out recently and said, you know, it could easily mean there's nothing he can do about it because there's only one person who can save their son's life, the heir to the throne, by the way. If you really believe that, this Rasputin guy's got you in a weird position. Between 1905, when the Tsar and Rasputin first meet, and where we are in this story right now, late 1916, Rasputin has been worming his way into the Tsar's family pretty consistently. Not his circle of friends, his family. The Tsar will have these get-togethers sometimes where it's him and his wife and his kids and Rasputin. Now there are back steps. Sometimes the relationship goes sour for a while, usually because Rasputin, who is a surreal misbehavior, does something particularly outrageous either embarrassing the Tsar so much that, that, that he does what his underlings are continually telling him to do and, and sends Rasputin away, or legitimately upsetting him. Nonetheless, every time he manages to break the relation, break up, I guess you could say, with Rasputin, inevitably, Alexei, his son, the heir to the throne, will get sick again, necessitating a return of Rasputin. He's like a cigarette habit you can't kick. 
Now, this Rasputin character is fascinating on so many levels. You know, you have to think you were dealt some interesting cards by fate to be able to parlay your gifts from his upbringing as, a, as an uneducated peasant with no money. And